every year I look at the internet and I find uh, what sorts of events are happening in the sky. Now, before you start thinking uh, about something weird, this is not about astrology, okay? I don't believe that the positions of the stars have any influence on my life unless our nearest star, the sun, suddenly decides to go out, and yeah, probably that will have an impact on everybody's life on Earth, but um, they can move. They can shine. And those that are very far away may even stop shining one day. What does that mean for my life today? Not much, but there is something that I, I have battled for years, and it is the clouds. And, and the reason for that is this. Whenever there's been a solar eclipse, and I go out, right, I, if, if it's the type that you have to look through, you know, a reflector, you can look directly at it, because see it will burn your eyes. I've gone out there with my reflector to look at a solar eclipse, and it's a cloudy day. And I can't see anything. Whenever there's been meteor showers, I have gone outside to look at the meteor showers, and all I get is rain showers instead. There was one time in Michigan, well, we were up there with my wife, that they said, you know, the inclination of the planet and the uh, magnetic forces of the planet will make it so as far as uh, northern Indiana, southern Michigan, you will be able to see the northern lights. Go out during this period of time, and if you look north, you're going to be seeing the beautiful display of color that comes with the northern lights. And of course, we planned on it. We thought about it. We said we are going to make sure that on that day, at that time, we go out there and look at this wonderful, beautiful thing. And when we went out there, we got to see all the light bouncing from the city and the cars coming back down to us from the clouds again. Back in 2019, I think it was, 2019-2020, Neowise Comet came by and... Uh, Luckily, that one took a few days, so I, I got to see that one and, and take a nice picture of it. But every single time, every single time, I look up to the skies because the Lord has created something beautiful, and I want to see it. The norm is that I can't because of our beloved friends, the clouds. What gives me courage is that there will be one day when I see a cloud in the sky that I will not be upset. Amen. Because even though clouds block my view from the stuff out there, on that day when I see that small cloud that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, I'm not going to care about anything else but that cloud. Because I know that on that cloud... The king of glory is coming back to have his children restored to communion with heaven. To bring them to a place where there will be no more suffering, no more death, no more illness, no more fighting and arguing. There will be none of these things. We're not going to have to contemplate the scope of politics or economics. We're not going to look at any of these things. We're just going to look at our Lord coming from heaven. And we will receive him with great joy and say, this is my God. We've waited for him and he has come back to take us home. Amen. That will be a glorious day. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have the date and time on your phones from, from when this is going to happen, right? Everybody have the date and time from when, when this is going to happen? 
Uh, many have claimed to know this. And if we're honest with our own history, the Millerite movement, which predated Adventism, in reading the scriptures, thought about this, and they set a date, and they were mistaken. Others in our time have done the same thing. But scripture is very clear in saying that no one knows the day or the hour. But we do know for certain that he will return. Is that right? He will return. And we may think he's taking too long. He's taking too long to return. He's not taking long. Because he's running late. He is not taking long because he forgot or because he is not prepared. I have full faith and confidence that if we were ready to receive him today, he would come today. But the reason why he hasn't come is because of his grace. He's still allowing time for us to understand who he is, to repent and turn our lives to him. He's still allowing time for us to contemplate on his majesty and his beauty and recognize him as God and creator. He's still allowing time for us to accept the gift of life that he offers. Because I know that he, were he to return today, many of us, me included, president of the general conference included, it doesn't matter who we are. If he were to come today, many of us may not be ready for his return. And it may be for one of two things. The first one is because we are caressing and loving sin in our lives and we're not willing to let it go. I had a professor that compared the human heart and the human mind like a house. Many of you probably have had this experience it's not so common nowadays to do this by surprise. But when I was younger, the pastor would come to the house of all his uh, church members randomly, unannounced. And so it was the case that when the pastor would come to the house, I have many friends who told me these funny stories about it. Pastor would come and knock. Somebody would come to the door and look through the people or open like a little bit of the door and look at who is outside. And uh, when uh, they would look and, it, and they noticed that it was the pastor, the door never would just swing open completely and say, come in. They would say, pastor, un momento, just, just give me a moment. Close the door and then they would go inside and say, es el pastor, it's the pastor. And they would go, and the, the pastor would just be standing outside the door, listening. And uh, some of the things that the pastor would hear is like, take that to your room, clean that up, move that up. Oh, go get some clothes on, you know, like, go put a shirt on. Or like, you're, you're all dirty, go clean, go, 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 fix your hair. And the pastor is just sitting outside the door, just waiting, waiting, and waiting. Till finally somebody comes to the door and opens the door. It's like, oh, hi, pastor. Sorry. Or making you wait. You say, oh, no problem. Please come in. They're still fixing their hair, trying to make sure that they're looking nice, right? Pastor comes in. Please sit right here. Pastor sits there. And the person that is talking to the pastor, for some odd reason, is not really paying attention to him. Not really engaging in the conversation. Not really participating of the blessing of the visit. But rather they're looking around. With the pastor sitting right there. They're looking around to see if they missed something. And when they're looking to see if they missed something. This happened to me once. Um, as a young man I went to do visitation with my pastor. And we did it by surprise. And the person that was there sat there with us, but she was looking at everything. And at one point, she got up and uh, walked in. Uh, she tried to be discreet about this, walked 
And then I noticed that she put her foot down on something. And when she continued walking, she was no longer picking up her foot. She was dragging her foot. And uh, at this point, the pastor was reading from Scripture. He is oblivious to what's going on. And I'm no longer listening to him. I'm just looking at what's going on. And she continues to say, let me go get you water. And so she went and disappeared for a moment. The pastor stopped. And when she came back, she was now bringing water, but she was taking normal steps. And I kept wondering, what on earth was under her foot? When the pastor shows up, in that context, we allow him to come into the living room. But would you allow him to come into the kitchen? We allow him to come into the living room, but would you allow him to go into your bedroom? We allow him to come into the living room, but would you allow him to go to the bathroom that you normally use? And most houses nowadays have multiple bathrooms, right? We have one especially for guests, and the other one is the one that we use, and uh, we probably would not want anybody to go in there at times. But if the human heart is like a house when the pastor comes to visit, the question is, is the human heart the same thing when Christ comes to visit? Are there areas of our heart that are off limits to Christ? Is the innermost center of our heart a place where we will be comfortable having Jesus in? Is that place in our being somewhere where Jesus would feel comfortable? And when I say that question, would Jesus feel comfortable in the deepest part of our heart? I say that because this is what most of us believe. And we believe that we must make our hearts ready for Jesus. And we open up areas, right? And we clean them up ourselves. But the truth is that we will never be able to clean up our hearts completely. There will be always be that one little room that we cannot clean for ourselves. I know that at one point or another, we all have dealt with pest controls. And... It doesn't matter how much we clean or how much we do. The pest continues to be there. And it is at that point when we need to have someone who specializes in that pest. To come and do the job that we cannot do for ourselves. We cannot clean our hearts from sin. We must allow Jesus to come into the darkest, dirtiest room of our heart and allow him to clean it for us because we cannot do it of ourselves instead of putting barriers and doors where we say Jesus you can only come up to this point in my life we say Jesus my house is a wreck my heart is a mess it's dirty there is clothes and 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 dirty dishes and things that that I'm ashamed of but they're everywhere in my home Please come into my home and help me clean this mess up. There is a type of Christian that lives this reality where their heart has compartments where Jesus cannot come in, where we hide our deepest and most cherished sins. There is even times where there is secret passages in our home that we are not even aware of. But they're there. But we may think that Jesus cannot come in. So if Jesus were to return today, would we be ready? There is the other type of Christian. And I think it's quite fitting for us, given our name. We are Seventh-day Adventist. Okay. And Seventh-day Adventist means two things. It involves are two most distinctive beliefs. The seventh day, the Sabbath, and I'm sure you all believe in it because here you are. And Adventist, perhaps the part of the name that's more famous and mostly used, Adventist, because we believe that Jesus will return. But why do we believe that Jesus will return? Scripture told us that he will. But what do we do in the meantime? Now, I open today with telling you 
my experience with looking at the sky. The disciples had an experience with them looking at the sky as well. In the book of Acts, you're going to read there that Jesus, after the resurrection, meets with his disciples and gives them what we call the commission to preach. The most famous version of that is the one you find in Matthew 28, but in Acts 1, you find it too. And if you read um, Acts chapter 1, verse 7, the first chapter of the book of Acts, verse 7, Jesus says to his disciples, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but, now think about this, this particular phrase starts with the idea of times and seasons. It's not for us to know times and seasons. The Father knows that. Things will happen when they will. But what do we do in the meantime? Verse 8. This is Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That last phrase includes you and me, to the ends of the earth. I want you to notice the order of things that are happening here. The first thing that Jesus does with these verses, he says, do not concern yourself with the time. That's not your task. You've been told that the Lord will return. And whenever he returns, you should be ready. But even if he returns a thousand years from now, you should be ready today. How are we going to be ready today? This is how many of us get ready today for the return of the Lord. Is the Lord coming? I don't know. Is that cloud the one from the Lord? No, that, that's a bigger cloud. No, that's just rain. Is the Lord coming? Yeah, he is. Where? Um, I'm not sure. Not, not in the sky yet, but we'll, we'll keep looking. Meanwhile, while our eyes are set to the skies, next to us, our brethren are dying. From hunger. Next to us, our brethren are dying and suffering because they don't have anything to feed their children at times. Sometimes our brethren are dying from loneliness. Sometimes our brethren are dying because they have been hurt by well intentioned members of our community. Sometimes our brethren are dying spiritually also because they cannot reconcile the evils that exist in our world against the loving character of a God that we don't fully know or understand. But as we continue looking into the heavens, into the skies, because we are Adventists, and when I say looking into the heavens, sometimes I I wonder if we have devoted so much attention to our eschatological understandings, the end times that we have forgotten to live in the here and now where people need our help and our love. When we continue looking at the skies, wondering when Christ will return to take me home, but we forget that when he returns, he's not coming just for me. If I was the only sinner, he would do that. But there are many others around me that if the Lord is coming for me, he's coming for them too. And I must extend my hand to them and help them 
pick themselves up from the suffering that this world brings and stand next to them firm waiting for the Lord yes but also picking others up from their sufferings it is not for us to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He will return when he will return. But in the meantime, what is the church doing? What are we doing with our time? Our speaker last week talked about time. What are we doing with our time? Acts 1.8 says, but you, you church, you elders, you young people, you, you will receive power. And the power does not come from academia. The power does not come from knowledge in our head. The power does not come from praxis in the things we do or we don't do. The power does not come from any of these things. The power comes from only one source. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you will be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Can we be good and faithful witnesses? Without the Holy Spirit. Can we truly declare the majesty and love and grace of God. When the Holy Spirit does not dwell within us. Can we truly go to God and say. God I'm being faithful in what you asked me to do. If the Holy Spirit is not within us. Let me paint this scenario. I like cars. My favorite car, my dream car, and I'm sure everybody has a, has a dream car. At one point, I was talking to Elias about Jeeps. I like Jeeps, but it's not my dream car. My dream car is one that I know I will never have. Somebody told me one day, Pastor, have faith. I'm like, I have faith that God will give me what I need. And I have faith that God will give me only what I need and that it's good that I don't get everything that I want. But if I could, if it was proper, if it was within my means, I would love to drive an Aston Martin Valkyrie. Now, if you have ever seen that car, and I'm sure that some of you may be looking at your phones and trying to look it up. What is an Aston Martin Valkyrie? It's a beautiful car. They made it so that you can drive it in the streets, but it has the performance of a Formula One car. Its curvatures are just, they create a, a wind coefficient that puts so much downforce on the vehicle and before I get distracted with the beauty of that car I will simply say I love that car but I will never have it but the beautiful thing about that car is not so much the curvatures the colors the gadgets that they put in it the designer of the car took the time to calculate the geometry, to put the right tires, to make sure that the engine is tuned perfectly. But the one problem with that car, as expensive and nice and beautiful as it may be, which is the same problem that an old beat up Toyota Corolla from, I don't know, the 70s or something, will also have. And that, that car from the 70s may not be as beautiful as the Aston Martin. It may not be as fast as the Aston Martin. It may not be as attractive and loud as an Aston Martin, but they both have the same problem. And it is that it doesn't matter how beautiful the car is, unless it has fuel, it doesn't work for anything. How many of you have been stuck in the road without fuel in the car? You ran out of gas and now you're just what am I going to do? 
you know, push it. Especially in the beautiful Texas heat, you do not want to be pushing a car. You wouldn't also want to be inside a car if it's not turned on, right? Be better off not to have it. Just walk, right? It doesn't matter how beautiful our understanding of the word is. How wonderful our plans are and how elaborate our services may be. It doesn't matter if we have the best musicians or not, the best speakers or not, the most comfortable and beautiful temple or not. If we have evangelistic meetings about prophecy every single year, twice a year, when we give books to thousands, it doesn't matter what we do or how beautiful it looks. It doesn't matter how much we stare into the sky waiting for the return of Christ. Because if the Holy Spirit is not the center stage of our lives, nothing we do has meaning. If the Spirit of God is not the one that convicts the heart and the mind, nothing we do has power. Look around you. How many empty chairs are there here? How many empty chairs are there in each church today, Sabbath? And if we even extend that notion to every other Christian church, how many empty chairs are there worldwide amongst the people who profess to share Christ? Why is that? Why is that? Is it because God does not have power? Is it because... We must fight against Satan because he's busy all the time and we must fight against him and somehow he proves to be stronger. Is that the case? Is our inefficacy to share the love of God because Satan is stronger? And I see many of you shaking your heads. Interesting thing about this is When Jesus told them what was supposed to happen, he said, you will receive power. And when you receive that power, which is the Holy Spirit, you will be witnesses. You will be witnesses to the health message first. This is what Jesus said, right? Look, look at it in your Bibles, verse 8, please. Open up your Bibles, open it in your iPad, on your phone, whatever you can have access to this information. If you have an old school scroll with it, read from that as well. I don't care where you read it so long as you read what the Word of God is saying here. It says, you shall be witnesses to the end times that we've never lived through ourselves. We have some notion of what will happen. You will be witnesses to the health message. You will be witnesses. And declare everything that Satan is doing out in the world so that people know. Is that what scripture says? You will be witnesses to who? You will be witnesses to what? To me. You will be witnesses to me. You will go to a broken world like I did, says the Lord. And you will love them. You will go to a broken world, look at their need, and supply for it. You will go to a broken world. And when you see your brother, your sister down and beaten by life, you will extend your hand and help them get up. You will go, and when you go, you will listen to those who are brokenhearted and offer your shoulder for them to cry on. You will go to the world and contemplate when people lose a loved one, 
You will cry with them, just like Jesus did when Lazarus died. You will look at the needs of the people, and just like Jesus did in Matthew 4, it says, He looked at the needs of the people, and He loved them. You will look at the world, at your friends, at your family, and you will understand that our job given to, to all of us by Jesus was not just to look up into the heavens hoping for something to happen. Where is the Lord? Where is the return? I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready. And next to us, there is somebody who needs somebody that will make them feel seen, understood, and loved. Somebody who will say, you're not alone. I'm with you. Somebody that will say, let me share with you the blessings that God has given me with you. I firmly believe that God blesses his church not just to make us have more enjoyable, comfortable lives. In fact, if you're truly faithful to God, enjoyable, comfortable, perhaps it's an oxymoron. But God blesses us so we can be a blessing to someone else. And all starts from the very beginning, from the very same point. None of this can happen unless you have fuel in your tank. None of this can happen unless you have that power of the Holy Spirit. This church will never be full unless the Holy Spirit truly and fully moves in us. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a divergent mind. The Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. The Holy Spirit does not argue against himself. The Holy Spirit empowers us and reminds us. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to discern the will of God. The Holy Spirit is the only one that gives us the power to witness. And when we witness who Jesus is, the power of the gospel cannot be compared to even the most expensive and elaborate program that anybody can come up with. The power of the Holy Spirit is such that after the disciples looked at Jesus going to the heavens, they did what we usually do. Read with me verses 9 through 11 here. Acts 1 verses 9 through 11. It says, Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, steadfastly why 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 would that be included it's not just that they were looking up they were constant they were there i don't know how long it took for these men to listen to the word of jesus and start looking at the sky and they looked and they looked and they looked i imagine them talking to each other and say do you think that's the cloud over there? No, no, no. I think it moved over there. And if you've ever spent time looking at the sky yourself, if it's bright, I don't know if this has happened to you. If you're looking at the sky and all of a sudden you start seeing like something's moving, there's like, like, like a current or something going on. There, there's this interesting effect that eyes have when you start looking at something that's bright for too long. And then let's imagine that you've been looking at the sky for a long time, right? Bright, beautiful. And then you put your eyes down and you happen to go into the shade. What happens? What are you able to see? We have transition glasses nowadays. When they are in the bright light of the sun, they turn dark. And when you come into the building... They're like sunglasses and you have to take them off because you can't see. We are staring into the sky aimlessly. Not fulfilling the mission. We lose, quite literally, we lose sight of what is around us. Give it a try one day. 
Go outside and contemplate a bright light and then go inside the house and see how good your sight is. It's going to, everything is going to look dark. Jesus did not command his disciples to waste their time looking into the sky, yet they were there. Verse 9 again. When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and the cloud received him out of their sight. Keep this in mind. They're not looking at Jesus anymore. They're just looking at the sky. Jesus is outside of their view. Their eyes are no longer contemplating him, who he is, what he does in a physical sense. And in a spiritual sense, the same thing. Because Jesus told them the Holy Spirit will come down upon you and you will be witnesses. Yet at that moment, they were just looking at the sky. Jesus said you will be fishers of men and they decided to become astronomers in that moment. They are looking at the sky steadfastly. Verse 10 says, while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Verse 11. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Can you imagine what this was like? They were perhaps staring at the sky for so long that they didn't even notice when this individual showed up. And maybe it's happened to you that you are so distracted by something and you don't realize when someone's come into the same space you're in and they talk to you, right? You're so intently looking at something, reading or fixing something, and somebody walks in and looks at you. They notice what you're doing. They may step out, come back, you're still doing the same thing. And they say, what are you doing there? And most people that have not noticed that there's somebody else in the room do what? They peacefully turn around and say, oh, I'm just working. And no, when you have no clue that somebody else there, somebody else is there with you because you're so distracted by something. And suddenly you hear their voice, their words that ask, why are you looking and gazing into heaven so intently? <gasps> right? Isn't that the reaction. I imagine these two angels just looking at each other like, you believe these guys? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You know this. You saw him go up and you will see him return. You were told this will happen, but you were also told what to do in the meantime. Before he comes back, what are you going to be doing? Staring at the sky the whole time? When he returns, you've been staring out there. He's going to say, okay, when the Holy Spirit came upon you, did you preach in Jerusalem? We haven't moved from here. We've been looking at the sky the entire time. She didn't go to Jerusalem. She didn't go to Judea. You didn't go to Samaria? How about the ends of the earth? Did you get there at some point? Did you open up yourself to receive the power of the Holy Spirit? Looking towards the second coming, my beloved friends and families. Looking at the second coming does not mean that we're just looking, reading, retaining. It means that we're reaching. We are serving. We're modeling the character of God to those who have never met him. You want to know how effective having the Holy Spirit is for a church? Jesus ascends 
they waste their time. The angels call them back and say, hey, stop doing that. Why do you keep doing that? You saw him go. He will return. You have a mission to do. So they finally get to working. And the first thing that they do, I'm going to challenge you to do this. I'm not going to tell you the whole story today because I know that physical hunger is real. But go home today and read the sequence of events in chapters 1 and 2. Because once they stop looking into the heavens aimlessly, they start getting down to business. They go back to Jerusalem. They fill the spot previously used by Judas. And they start to pray. And when they start to pray, when they start to pray, they don't pray that the Lord will convince others of how they perceive the mission. They don't pray about any other thing but to request what God promised. And they start to pray, they start to pray, they start to pray. In the beginning of chapter 2, you see that when the day of Pentecost came, and they were all in one accord. Were they the same person? No. Did they like the same things? No. Did they do the things in the same fashion all the time, every time? No. But being in one accord meant that they had a single purpose, a single mission. They were praying and saying, God of heaven, send your Holy Spirit that you promised us. God of heaven, we need your Holy Spirit. God of heaven, please be with us. Give us that power. And when they were one accord with that petition, just wanting the Holy Spirit to be there, for them to truly go and start doing something, and notice that they went to Jerusalem and they spoke to no one until the Holy Spirit came down to them. They didn't go out with their head cannon and their knowledge to start speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem without the power of the Holy Spirit because they understood that they were to testify only when the Holy Spirit was upon them, not before. So if you're going to testify to someone who Jesus is, do so only when the Holy Spirit is upon you and not before. Because we have tried sharing the gospel without the power of the Holy Spirit. And sadly, the church has become the most secularizing force on earth. And this is not because of sin. Everybody has sin. I have sin. You have sin. The problem is that we have not testified of Jesus correctly because we haven't done so with the proper power, which is the Holy Spirit. And until we ask God and put it in prayer and becomes our single petition, God, fill me, fill this church with your spirit. Before you have that source of power, it'd be better for you not to testify of anything. Because nothing we do without the Holy Spirit will truly be effective. So they went and prayed, and that was their petition in church. Let's make that our petition for Macaulay and all nations. That the Holy Spirit may be the source of power for everything we say and everything we do. That every action, every program, every pray, uh, drive-by prayer uh, activity, every youth activity, everything we do may be done under the power of the Holy Spirit, not just our pure desire. Because the church is not a church as a social club where when we come together and we say all the holy people gather in this place, but only the holy ones. This is not the case. This is a place for sinners. And this is a place where sinners come to be redeemed and changed through the power of him who saved them. And that power is from the Holy Spirit. If our church does not have the Holy Spirit... It doesn't matter how beautiful that Aston Martin Valkyrie is. If it doesn't have fuel, it's worthless. 
They prayed for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came down to them, the Holy Spirit gave them very interesting things. He allowed for them to speak in languages. Yes, Excel languages. There are many people who think that this was some crazy, nonsensical thing going on. If you ever want to talk about the subject, I welcome the conversation. But the Holy Spirit gave them abilities that were beyond their understanding, but they were abilities that appeal both to the heart and to the mind. We cannot be a church only of the mind. We need to be a church of both heart and the mind, where we allow ourselves to understand and we allow ourselves to feel the love of God. There are churches that are all about the heart, but not the mind, and they go with any wind that blows. There are churches that are all about the mind, but not the heart, and they forget that their brethren is dying next to them while they look at the sky waiting for the glorious return of their Lord. Jesus cried when he saw suffering, and he also argued with those who professed to know the word, but they didn't understand it well. Jesus gave us both the heart and the mind, not for them to be separate from one another, but to be engaged together. Because we are holistic beings, we're not just computers that understand logical data, and that's it. We're not all heart that it's dumb. We are people that are emotional and rational. Both things are important. And when the Holy Spirit comes down, allows them both to understand and to feel. And when Peter stands up, I have never met an evangelist that's been able to do this. And we have some really good evangelists. Many of you probably follow some of them. I'm Mark Finley, we have Doug Batchelor, we have all of these famous guys, right? And they have to go from place to place, and they do this and that, and there's a lot of money that's spent in, in many different things and travel and whatnot. Peter didn't have a budget. Peter didn't have advertisement. Peter didn't have a building. He didn't have a transportation team. He didn't have a special events team. He didn't have flyers given out. He didn't have Facebook advertisement. He didn't have YouTube videos. He didn't have any of those things because none of that is necessary. They are nice. They are powerful when we give them to God. But none of them are necessary. The only thing that's necessary is the Holy Spirit. And once Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, the man that at some point said to Jesus, you don't have to die. And Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. The man at some point who... When a, a person that had no bearing on his outcome said, are you one of the people that were with him? He said, no, 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 that, that's not me. I have nothing to do with that man. Please leave me alone. The same man that denied Jesus three times, the same man that took out his sword because he thought that he needed to defend God. Have you ever heard this? We need to defend God. God does not need defending. God defends himself. God did not ask us to defend him. God asked us to love and to share the gospel. That is the mission. The Great Commission doesn't say, sharpen up your swords and go and take down anybody who doesn't believe. No, that's not the mission. The mission is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and love. Filled with the Holy Spirit and guide. Filled with the Holy Spirit and point to Jesus. That is the mission. Peter didn't have any of those things. But look at how powerful the Spirit of God can be. If you read the end of chapter 2. And all of chapter 2. You see that once filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter gets up. Preaches with the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you go to chapter 2 verse 40. Act chapter 2 verse 40. It says. 
and with many other words. He testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Is that an important message? Yes. Is that what we proclaim all the time? Yes, it is. But let's compare results, shall we? Verse 41. Then those who gladly, gladly, this means that the message should make the person receiving it glad, not angry. If the person is angry, there is something wrong with our approach. When those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about Could we feed this amount of people in here today? And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. One sermon. No flyers, no videos, no YouTube, no nothing. No budget, no venue, no fancy musicians. I'm not saying that well-prepared music is a bad thing. What I'm saying is... That everything that we do today needs to have that source of power. For if Peter didn't have any of it, and 3,000 people accepted the gospel with one sermon. Can you imagine if you baptized 3,000 people after every single sermon? How long would it take for us to reach all of the valley. 3,000 people a day. Can you imagine that? If you have your phone, you can make the calculation and just think about how many people will we reach in a year with that sort of power. And how long have we been here? How long have we been Christians in America, in the world? And how many empty chairs do we still have? Is it because God is not powerful enough? Or is it because we forgot the source of power? The Aston Martin Valkyrie that I like so much, if I roll it down the hill, would go just as fast as an, older, uh, as an older, beat up, ugly car. Church of God, you have one mission. One mission alone. Testify who Jesus is. But when you do, don't do it without power. Don't just stare into the sky waiting for him to return. When he returns, will he find you looking into the heavens just waiting, doing nothing? Or when he returns, will he find you loving, testifying, and reaching those he asked you to reach? We are at the ends of the earth. And I'm not mean that as a time. I mean that in distance. There is very few places in the planet where the gospel has not reached. The sad thing about it is, geographically speaking, there may be few places in the planet but what about those rooms of the heart? Is there rooms in your heart where the gospel hasn't reached? That is the ends of the earth. And that is why we need the Holy Spirit today. And I challenge you. I ask you. I beg you. Let's be in one accord for that soul petition. Holy Spirit, be with us. Amen. May God bless you today.